Hello, I'm Paul Perello, and welcome to The Philly Factor. Located in the historic Topohocken Station District of Philadelphia is the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. This building, this home, takes us back to the Victorian era of uh, our country, of our history. It's Philadelphia's only authentically restored Victorian house museum. The mission of the museum is to, and quoting from their website, showcase Victorian era Philadelphia through the architecture grounds, gardens, and collections, as well as to educate, entertain, and inspire the public through on-site educational programs, tours, theater productions, and lectures. Well, I remember the first time that I toured the Ebenezer um, Maxwell Mansion. It was a long time ago. It was not, trust me, it was not the Victorian era when I was there. Uh, but I was a student here at LaSalle, and we took a, it was a Philadelphia history class that I had, and we toured many of the um, historic sites in and around LaSalle, and one of the places where we stopped was the Ebenezer Maxwell uh, Mansion. And uh, I found it pretty exciting. This kid from South Philly coming out of my comfort zone and touring history that I did not know existed outside of my comfort zone. Well, we're going to shed a little bit of knowledge for each and every one of our viewers watching today about the uh, Maxwell Mansion and grounds. And here to help us through that is the executive director, uh, Diane Richardson, joins us here on the program. Thanks Hi, for Paul. being with us. Hi. Finally, uh, we get together, we talk <laughs> about this uh, wonderful uh, museum, as I said, that I first toured when I was a student here at LaSalle. And I guess uh, it has changed. I haven't been there recently, but uh, through the website, and the website will come up on the um, screen throughout the program, so you can check out the website and actually uh, book a tour if you want, uh, and we hope you do, of the, uh, of the mansion. But as I said, back then, um, I was blown away by what I found behind this building. First thing, when we drove up, and we were in a bus at that time, it reminded me of, with all due respect, a haunted house. <laughs> You know, we, well, we, we have a murder mystery every year. That's, that's true, which we'll, which we'll get to. Um, and then I started reading that the house may have been, or is, or was, the, um, uh, the model for the Adams family house? We like to say so. Yeah? You know, Charles Adams did live in the neighborhood. Okay. And, but we, you know, he's no longer alive, so there's no way we can prove this. But it has been said, and we'll say it. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the original inhabitants, inhabitants of the... Uh, the residents of the of the home. Uh, who were they? Where did they come from? And why did they decide? Did they build the house? Yes, Ebenezer Maxwell built the house in 1859 for $10,000 and sold it in 1862 actually for 13000 and that was a profit of $3,000 back then and in like 2017 money that would be $81,000. Mm -hmm. But he, he and his wife Anna had previously lived one block over on Walnut Lane and um, in a, they had rented and many of the homes in the neighborhood were built specifically as sort of a spec. Mm -hmm. When he married Anna, he was from upstate New York and he married Anna, his second cousin. And shortly after they were married, uh, her, hus her father died and he inherited the money and that's the money he used to build the house. Hmm, interesting. And so um, the neighborhood at that time, I mean, we often think of like communities like Germantown, yes. uh, you know, um, Aldi, Logan. These were like bedroom communities for business people yes. who would conduct their business in Center City. And at the end of the day, they would come out to the suburbs, what was the suburbs then. So is that um, why they decided to build this house in, in Topolhocken? Yes. The Ebenezer Maxwell rode the train every day downtown to his business. He was a cloth wholesaler. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, they knew that the, they, the train lines had come out to East Germantown in 1837, but the Tulpahawk and the West, um, West um, Chestnut Hill West Line came out in the 1880s. Okay. So it was, you know, a lot of people built homes out there because you could have your family out in the country, although it was incorporated as part of the city of Philadelphia, and, and, and then work downtown. Yeah. So when a person visits the, the Maxwell Mansion, uh, they really are stepping back to this Indeed. time. And, you know, the, the thing is, it, with, uh, I guess, to, to your advantage, is that there aren't many of these homes that are left, number one, or there aren't many of these homes that are left in pristine condition yes. that they could open their doors and welcome people in to see what it, Victorian life was like. 
Well, and we are Philadelphia's only authentically restored Victorian house museum. There are other Victorian institutions like the Wagner Free Institute and the Athenaeum, but this is the only place where you can walk up the sidewalk, up the front door, and come in and see what it was like to live in um, 1859 in Philadelphia. Mm. We, we saw a picture of the, uh, of the mansion just a short time ago. So um, uh, given um, 2018, 2019, yes. you know, the 21st century that we're in right now, is the neighborhood, are there other um, um, buildings there or homes that might look like uh, the Maxwell Mansion or would it be typical Philadelphia row homes that surround the mansion? Well, the, it is, it, the whole neighborhood is on the National Register of it Historic is. Places as one of America's first railroad suburbs. So on Topahawken Street over on Walnut Lane, between Wayne Avenue and Germantown Avenue, there are many sort of big mansion-y type homes. Okay. And they are owned by families. Uh, oftentimes they'll have an apartment on the third floor. Mm -hmm. So there are other homes in the neighborhood that um, don't necessarily look like the mansion though. Okay. Um, but, and the mansion is iconic, it's, it's kind of unique. Yeah. But there's Queen Anne. This is this. The mansion is considered uh, Victorian eclectic. Okay, and there's a picture of it right there. And yes. so you can imagine if you're driving down a street in that part of the city <laughs> and you see this, it does stand out. It does. And I stand remember, out. you know, when we were on that bus tour way back when, uh, you know, and, and and you know, knowing Germantown and knowing this part of the city, it does really stand out amongst all the other homes and buildings that are in that part of town. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, so, is there any connection to, uh, you know, either the Maxwells or you said a few years after they owned the house, they sold it. So, is there any connection to the families that once inhabited that house? Indeed, we know we know many of the descendants. So, um, the Maxwell family. The um, recently we needed new carpeting in the uh, hallway and the stairway, and you know you had to get documentary reproduction carpet mm -hmm. made in England on the 29-inch looms. Wow! And one of the Maxwell great great uh, great great or great 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 granddaughters <laughs> gave the money, wow. and it was twelve thousand yeah. dollars. And then the second family that owned it was William and Rosalie Hunter, and we also recently. Uh, got reacquainted with some Hunter descendants who live up in, um, I think, upstate New York. They came down. I thought, so I, we do we do know them. Yeah. We do know have contact with some of them. Yeah, and, and, and that's interesting because um, you know, oftentimes um, descendants of these families either just wither away or want to have nothing to do with their family's past, and you know, for whatever reason. But it's encouraging to know that there is some type of involvement. Uh, and some connection to the history of this home with the descendants of those families. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Um, what when I toured the, the the mansion with my classmates back in the late 70s? Um, all I can remember it was it was dark, it was dingy, it was furnished somewhat, but it would be sort of like the museum you would think you're going to walk into, where nothing has been ever really hasn't been touched. You know how the last inhabitant left it, the last resident left and locked the door on the way out is how it was, but uh, that's not the way today. This, what I like about the mission of, of your organization is that, Diane, it, history does come alive there through a number of the programs. That's really what we try to do. Yeah. We try to make it fun and interesting. So one of our, our sort of um, benchmark program is our Victorian theater mm -hmm. program, and we take uh, 19th century literature and also plays, but maybe Maybe, for example, in uh, 2016, we did a full um, site-specific production of Little Women, okay. Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, and you know, Louisa May Alcott was born in Germantown. How about that? So, it, and it was a world premiere, uh, written and directed by Josh Hitchens, and um, we um, played to a very small audience, about 35 people in the parlor, mm -hmm. but it, it was very compelling. And then in um, 2017, we did a full production of Anna Green Gables. How about that? Yeah. But then we also have one person um, interpretation. So in 2016, we did Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. Mm -hmm. And it, you may or may not know, but that's the story of a woman in the 19th century who is losing her mind and her husband and the physician decide to lock her in a bedroom mm -hmm. with yellow wallpaper and she loses her mind and it's an expose not only on how women were treated, but how the mentally ill were treated. Wow. And so, you know, very, 
we get good responses with a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah, and the first thing that, you know, and, and when reading about the, the production of Little Women at the house, it's like, well, this has got to be a very intimate um, production, is. not only for the audience, but for the actors, yes. because when you have 35 people that are sitting in the parlor watching this production, um, it, it, it's, it's a different theater experience, if you will, because uh, you could probably see every bead of sweat on the actors or yes. actresses' foreheads, and you know any noise that the audience is going to make is going to be heard by the other 34 people in the room with you. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's very intimate, and the actors actually just love it. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're right in the room with, you know, with the audience, and they they can get a good response that way. It's a very wonderful experience. Yeah. So I, I you know, I have to ask from the theatrical standpoint, then, you know, how do you stage a production like that, given that uh, oftentimes productions we're used to seeing elaborate style productions, and now we're seeing something totally different and very intimate between the actors and the audience. So how do you how do you balance that? Well, what's fabulous about the mansion is that it's set in the actual Victorian parlor of the building. Mm -hmm. So you're never, I mean, unless you're on Broadway, you're never going to get a set that's that magnificent. Yeah, and it's yeah. fabulous. So um, it you know really has worked out. And the creative director, Josh Hitchens, has a way of arranging the chairs and the way uh, people come and go, you know, fr from the room, of just making it work. It's, it's amazing. You, you can't believe that it works the way it does. Yeah, and when you stage a production like that, uh, given the historic nature of the building, and even the parlor for that matter, do you have to worry about the integrity of the oh, yes. room? Uh, because, you know, the simplest movement of anything could, could prove a challenge for you after the production is over. Indeed, well that's my job, to make mm -hmm. sure nothing bad happens to anything in the collection and yeah. I drive everybody crazy. Right. We do remove a lot of the furniture for these productions, so, uh, you know, a lot of it's protected and, you know, if they're getting too close to the wall sconce, I tell them, don't get too close to the wall sconce. <laughs> so it, it works out great and Josh is very respectful of the building. Yeah, when, uh, when you talk about the only Philadelphia authentically uh, reproduced mm -hmm. uh, Victorian era uh, mansion. Um, a lot of work has to go into that to make sure yes. that everything is what it claims to be. Yes. Everything from, I guess, the floors to the wallpaper yes. Yes. Uh, to the furnishings. What, when um, and, and so your organization, which oversees, maintains, mm -hmm. does it own the building or? It's the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion Incorporated is, is a 501c3 okay. not-for-profit house museum. Okay. And it's operated by a board of directors and uh, one employee, although now I do have some paid interns to help me. Okay. So, so we have to be very careful that everything is carefully researched and any work that done is done is done accurately and correctly. Yeah. So when you actually go then and stage a production like this, and are there certain, let's say there are certain lighting or staging needs uh, that you need for the production, again, you have to be cognizant of the history uh, of that, uh, of, of the building so that even the slightest nail or picture that's moved on a wall could compromise the historical integrity. We, we don't move any pictures. No pictures are moved. <laughs> um, we do remove, we have these authentic, um, tassels that were made for us in France, and I do remove some of those off the uh, draperies. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, generally, um, we, oh, and special lighting, when we originally did the site-specific productions in the parlor, the first ones we did were Sherlock Holmes, and we did have special lighting with spotlights, and we had lights on poles and everything, and anymore, the creative director feels he can do it more effectively without any of that. Okay. We do have a dimmer, so we can, dim, you know, put the light, dim the lights to, to zero. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting. And then the other sort of um, theater we do every year, we do a murder mystery. Okay. So um, that is a walking tour, and it's similar to the game of Clue, but in, just say yeah, that, yeah. instead of your Game Boy moving on the board, you move from room to room in the museum where you're greeted in each room by an actor portraying a suspect. And so, it, 350 people come to this wow. year after year yeah. on two weekends. Yeah. So it could be the candlestick in the library. That's correct. And it could be the butler, right? That's correct. That's <laughs> correct. Now, the 2018 murder mystery 
is entitled A Seance to Remember. Okay. So we think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, so you might even, uh, who knows, maybe Ebenezer and his wife may even <laughs> return for that seance. It could possibly. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. But, it, Josh writes it. So, yeah. yes. Um, when you, and I know uh, from the pictures that I've seen and some of them that have flashed up during the, during the program, I mean, let, let's just take the wallpaper in, in, yes. in the building. Yes. Because, I, as I said, when I toured early, uh, you know, when I was here at LaSalle as a student, I noticed that oh, there was, yes. yeah, there you go. Um, I, I don't necessarily remember the wallpaper being that elaborate or that ornate or even that chandelier. So how does one, how does your organization, how are you able to find wallpaper like that that may have actually been used or something similar to that may have been used in the mansion? The wallpaper in the dining room, the parlor, and the downstairs hallway were, were all installed in 2008 because okay. the original wallpapers that the originators of the museum installed were just falling off the walls. There were mildew issues. Mm. And all three of those wallpapers are documentary reproductions, scalamandry wallpapers from the era. So, the, for example, the parlor wallpaper is a Rococo revival documentary reproduction wallpaper. And interestingly, Paul, the downstairs of the museum is interpreted to the 1860s, whereas the upstairs of the museum is interpreted to the 1880s. Hmm. So downstairs, you're going to see a completely different style of decoration than you do on upstairs. That's interesting. And that really helps. You know, it's, it's amazing that they came, this is the originators of the museum, came up with that idea. So when you visit, you can really get a glimpse of how quickly everything changed in the course of 20 years. Yeah, I was going to say, I, one doesn't necessarily think of, uh, in, in any era, that there would be a significant change in even, you know, wallpaper or furnishings within 20 years. It's shocking. Yeah. It's actually shocking. I'm still getting used to it. Yeah. And so, um, the downstairs is more exuberant. Um, you know, the, the furnishings are more heavily carved and upstairs it becomes more tightly pulled in, the aesthetic movement, but also they had, the, the second owners had a lot more money than mm -hmm. the Maxwell. So the upstairs represents a little bit more, you know, shows more money. Yeah. And so if, if the one image comes up with the Egyptian revival painted and, and stenciled wall decoration in the upstairs hallway, that was some money. Mm. But based on the centennial celebration in Philadelphia, and that's original. Yeah. That well, was there and really? it's, yep. Wow. And, but, you know, um, one of the things that I remember, and I, I'm sure is still the, the, the case, is that you can get up close and personal with the history of the yes. Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. And, you, you know, there, there's not necessarily a censor or a security guard standing over your, you know, your shoulder saying, you know, don't touch that, you know, because we're talking about things that are hundreds of years old here. And, you know, whether it's the wallpaper or the floorboards, you're really able to interact with, with history, where is it? some other museums, you don't get that close exposure to history. Well, we do. We don't have anything roped off. And we do, when people take a tour, there is a docent with you, and mm -hmm. we do um, chide you not to touch anything, <laughs> don't sit on anything, don't lean on anything. Right. But you can get up as close as you want, and yeah. that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It, does the museum offer uh, something for everyone, meaning that, uh, you know, I don't want to paint the picture here that this is only um, uh, something for people that have an interest in the Victorian era. I suspect it really has something to offer. Hey, look, if you like flowers and gardens, we could talk about the gardens here yes. too, is that there is a whole other aspect of the Maxwell Mansion uh, that might be of interest to you. Yes, indeed. And we try to make our programming appealing to adults and children alike, although coming up, you know, we currently have that art exhibition that mm -hmm. I believe I was telling you about. Um, you know, we had children, we had the grand opening or the opening reception on Saturday and 85 people were there and mm. there were children and adults alike. So, um, and then coming up in June, we're doing Chekhov's Three Sisters, which would more so appeal to, to adults. Mm -hmm. But at Christmas, we always do a children's event. We usually do an old fashioned picnic. Um, we have a lot of family-friendly events. Yeah. Um, the gardens. Yes. Because I don't remember the gardens, you know, when we took the tour of the mansion. And now there are some beautiful gardens there. Yes. And uh, so who, first of all, I'm sure, Diane, you yourself are not going out there and pruning the bushes. <laughs> I'm sure there is someone there or volunteers that are there to help maintain the gardens. Well, you know, we're fortunate because McFarland 
tree, McFarland Trees does all of our all of our tree work a, a, as a gift to us. Mm -hmm. They they're right down the street on Top of Hawkins okay. Street. But um, we we do have volunteers that do a lot of the garden work. However, uh, generally on an annual basis, I apply to the Philadelphia chapter of the Garden Club of America, mm -hmm. and we get some amount of money and pay to have some of them professionally installed. But the original gardens were designed by um, um, Engel, who was with the Philadelphia Horticultural Society. Okay. Back in the 1980s, he was, he was a preeminent um, landscape architect. And so there are two parts of the garden. The, the Downing Garden is in the front, mm -hmm. facing Topa Hawkins Street, and the Scott Garden is in the back. And the Downing Garden is a little earlier, and Downing had very interesting ideas about gar garden design. So in each bed, you could only have one color of flowers. Mm -hmm. So we have the purple bed, the pink bed, the white bed. And then Scott believed in a kitchen garden. So we have grapes, um, a, a run of gooseberries, we have uh, strawberries. So it's complete, two different, just like the house, the inside of the house is interpreted to two different eras, so are the gardens. Yeah, interesting. So yeah. So if someone wants to come and tour, the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion and Victorian Gardens. Um, how could they do that? Well, generally, we're open to the public Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoons, and the tours are offered at specific times, 12, 15, 1, 15, 2, 15, 3, 15, and you just show up. Mm -hmm. However, we're now rolling out a series of Spanish language tours, and one of my interns is was born in uh, Cuba and raised in Spain, so she's bilingual with Spanish as her first and it's, you know, we're getting a pretty good response. We just started it. So for those, um, you know, you might want to have a reservation and they aren't offered, offered as often. Mm -hmm. And we're actually, the, the uh, Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is helping us with this. That's fantastic. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. So the fact that these tours are every hour on the hour, yes. like you said, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday. Um, so an hour could get you in and out and yeah. get a real good feel. Yeah, indeed. Of what, of what's yes, going indeed. On. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as as the executive director, uh, it, it's uh, the task. Excuse me, I've gotten all choked up here. The task <laughs> to save this building and maintain this building has got to be um, so overwhelming. Did you ever wonder if no one stepped in, if no one cared, if if this building was just allowed to sit there and just wither away, um, what, what a, a, a lost chapter of our history that we would have if no one stepped in to I think I think the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion is tremendously important because it is the only house museum in Philadelphia that shows you what it's like. And the Victorian age was so fascinating. Yeah. You know, just the literature, the, uh, you know, some of the things that happened, the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution. Sure life changed in America during that during that era and you know you want to know about it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely I mean and, and there's so much to see so much to do um, and it's literally um, a, a short drive if you're downtown Philadelphia it is if you're in Northeast Philadelphia it's uh, it's easy to get to directions are provided on the map so you can find where it is that you're going and I did not realize that the, how long has the uh, district the historic district uh, been there because I suspect it was not there back in the 70s and the 80s. I believe it, you know, I, I, I should know that information, but I'm thinking late 80s, okay. something like that. And, yeah. it, and another way you can get there is by taking the, Topo, the Chestnut Hill West and okay. there's a station in Topa Hawkins. How about that? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And so um, any organization, especially when you're a nonprofit organization, uh, you're always looking for volunteers, you're always oh, yes. looking for help, uh, financial, uh, you know, support, wh whatever it is that you could do. How could people get in touch with the organization and if they want to be a volunteer and maybe, uh, uh, you know, help, you know, provide tours or whatever it is that they could do, how could they go about that? It's very easy. We have a, a um, link on our website and you can fill out a volunteer application and I get that and then you know you're invited in for an interview and mm -hmm. that's how we do get a lot of our help and yeah. it's amazing. We also have a donate button. Mm -hmm. Always <laughs> please, important. Please donate. Yeah, yes, it's always yes. important. Or become yeah. a member. It's it's important. It's it's um you know there's a lot of competition out there and, mm -hmm. and but it is a very important museum that deserves people's attention. Yeah. In the 2 minutes that we have left here, what is it that you hope 
people when they walk through that front door of the, of the mansion, what is it that you hope they come away with as they exit the mansion? I just want them to uh, have a wonderful experience and I want them to learn something and they will. Yeah, for sure. They will and learn it's an important, you know, as you said, it's an important part of our history that in this day and age we are so busy just trying to stay one pace ahead of ourselves of the 21st century, but it's refreshing that you could take this step back in time and literally experience a home um, and the grounds of this mansion that uh, you know transcend just more than you know 20 years. I mean, you, you walk in 1860, go upstairs, you're in 1880. It's real. It's really amazing. Yeah. It really is quite amazing. Yes. Yeah. There aren't too many um, offerings like that, you know, in in Philadelphia. Well, and just the whole experience. You you walk through the iron gate. You walk up the brick pathway to the front door. It's it's a very experiential. And in the day in this age of iPads, iPods, you know, phones, it's kind of a nice reprieve from yeah, all that. Yeah, for sure. Although I have a really good picture of two of my docents dressed in costumes on their iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> so then and now, you yeah. know. Yeah. So the so the the people, the tour guides, the docents, they're they're dressed in. Period many of them, not all. Okay. But many. We do have quite a few. Yeah. And do you, um, um, and how do you um, make sure that they are fitting the part of whether it's 1860 or 1880? How? Do well, we're pretty. You know, we, we've got several. Um, we've got one Dawson who is a costumer. Okay. And so she might be one week dressed uh, 1880, the next week dressed 1860, and then many of my interns have costumes, and they would be sort of a more generic Victorian look, but still to give you the feel yeah, well, of what that was like. This has been a fascinating uh, half hour, and I know where I'm going. Uh, I'm <laughs> well, coming you out. better. Yeah, I better after this, right? <laughs> I'm going to come out and see you and see all the, uh, the things that I did not see the first go around when I was at the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion out in Topolhocken. So uh, I want to thank Diane, Diane for being with us and um, get out there to the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. Until the next time, my name's Paul Perello. Thanks for, for, thanks for being with us here on The Philly Factor.